Let's do this. Let's pick up where we left off. So, um, last time we were talking about tumor suppressor genes, right? And so we're getting ready to talk about bonka genes, whatever those are. Um, so let me just kind of sort of back up a little bit and sort of explain a little bit about what tumor suppressor genes are, because this is actually a pretty um, important component to sort of lay some of the groundwork uh, kind of going forward. It actually does sort of underpin how cancers actually behave um, and how they come to be in some cases and uh, and kind of what drives them, right? So last time we talked a little bit about, we were talking about cancer is essentially pretty simple in its conception. All cancer is is basically uncontrolled cell growth, right? So cells that are basically sort of flying off the rails, they're not going rogue. They're not listening to control. They're not listening to instructions. And they are basically doing their own thing. Um, and remember, we have two mantras in cell division. Number one, do it right or die, right? Number two is do what you're told or die, right? So notice the die thing in there. There's a lot of death, right? Because ultimately um, the consequences of not doing it right or not doing what you're told essentially leads to death anyway, right? Um, so a good example is cancer cells. Right, cells with under, uncontrolled cell growth, they're not doing what they're told. And so as a result, either they die as a cell or you die as an organism. So which one do you think is actually better? Yeah, yeah you can live without a few cells, you can always replace them. But if you die, you're screwed, that's a fail when it comes to the biological purpose of life, okay? So not only did you not reproduce, but you actually didn't live. Um, so that's a bad thing. <clears throat> so what, and this is kind of bears because a lot of times uh, even uh, students will kind of not get this on the first pass. But what I want to do is I want to basically sketch out a little bit about the organization of a gene. And this will actually come in handy a little bit later on. When we talk about transcription translation as well. So basically what we start off with is a gene. Typically in this case, because we're talking about cell division, it's a cell division gene. And? In a, as a good soldier, right? The cell division gene will essentially be turned off. Um, and it'll be in its off state because it's not dividing. So basically, if you are not dividing, then you should be in your off state. And that's kind of where we are here. <clears throat> now, in the box, this is basically your coding region. And this will become protein. Now, along with the coding region, you also have um, kind of like a little start site with what's called the promoter. And the promoter is a region that drives the gene function, the gene activity, the gene expression, if you will. Now, just upstream of this is a region that is essentially the regulatory region. So none of this becomes protein. This is all just basically controlling um, what, how you turn the gene on and off, right? So this is the control mechanisms. There's a lot of different controllers in here. Some of them are environmental, what we call response elements that will respond to environmental signals and cues. Um, but one of the common ones that you see, especially in the cell division gene, is a particular piece of DNA that will bind to a special protein called the tumor suppressor. And a tumor suppressor does exactly what it says. It suppresses the development of a tumor. So in this case, what actually tumor suppressor does is it actually inhibits, that's kind of the black. Basically, it inhibits. Okay, are we singing? Who's that? Let's check to see who that is. Oh, no, she mic'd herself off before I could get there. <laughs> Uh, in the Monday morning class, we had somebody singing um, online, so um, they and I made some sort of a comment, so they have to figure it out. But um, 
It was a good, I mean, it was a great performance, but it was just not appropriate. But anyway, um, right? So the flat bar basically denotes uh, an inhibition. If it were activating it, it would be an error, okay? So normally what a tumor suppressor does is its job is to keep the cell division gene turned off until it's needed. Now, part of the problem is that there's a gene, a separate gene that encodes the tumor suppressor protein, right? And just like any other gene, you get one from your mom and one from your dad. Generally speaking, a tumor suppressor gene will be inherited as a recessive. What does that mean? That means you need two copies of it, right? To get any kind of an abnormal mutation phenotype. Now, in this particular case, imagine that you got two healthy copies of this tumor suppressor gene from your parents. No family history of cancer, nothing like that. And so generally speaking, what happens when you're just alive is you're constantly bathed in radiation. It's just a part of being alive, right? You have a certain amount of radiation that's always hitting you and bombarding you, it's damaging your DNA, you're fixing it, and you just go right back out there and you keep skiing and you get sunburned again and it keeps damaging your DNA and you keep fixing it, right? And so basically this is just life. It's just kind of the, the, the cost of doing business on this planet. Generally speaking, as you live your life, you are randomly being mutated. That sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? But that basically means all this cosmic radiation, all this UV radiation, all the chemicals that we surround ourselves in, all of these things are like little micro insults that will basically mutate our DNA. That mutation is random. So you don't know which genes you're mutating. You don't know uh, if it's the same as somebody sitting next to you. It's completely random. Now, generally speaking, because it's a random process, it takes probably between two to three decades. So you're talking about you're in your 20s, 30s, you pick up your first mutation in this particular tumor suppressor gene. Okay. But because it's a recessive, you're okay. Right, because all you need in a recessive is one copy. So the normal copy would be considered the dominant. The mutant copy would be considered the recessive. So you're okay, because you still have one to cover you, right? Well, another two, three, maybe even four, if you're lucky, decades later, you pick up the second one. Now you're screwed, right? Because now what happens is if you pick up that second mutation, you essentially lose your tumor suppressor you also lose your off signal, which means now, now your cell division gene that you had controlled and turned off is now free to turn on. Without control, because you're no longer there to control it. Now this doesn't mean that the second you pick up that second mutation, it's like you're off to the oncologist. It's It takes process, right? So. Tumor development is a, oftentimes can be a very long evolving process. So just because your cells start to go a little wonky doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're standing in the front of the line of the chemotherapy ticket office, right? So that's, it takes time for these cells after they've started to kind of fly off the rails to actually become a problem. It could be if you're lucky, that this particular cell division gene, even though it's kind of rogue, is not the most catastrophic thing to sort of, sort of let go, right? Um, and so you may take either forever to develop a problem or you may never develop a problem, especially if you pick this thing up like when you're in your 60s. It could be that you're gonna die of a heart attack because of all the hot dogs and chips and stuff like that that you ate long before you're gonna get sufficient enough time for tumor development. This underscores two different things, first of all. Number one is <coughs> most of us have two healthy copies. So we don't have to freak out just because we have a little bit of cosmic radiation or background radiation around, okay? Because we we're bathed in it, right? There's nothing super special about that. It's just existence. A lot of people don't realize that, okay? Number two <coughs> is this also explains the reason why cancer is associated with old people more frequently than young people. Why? 
because most of the cancers that you're picking up are going through this exact same process. It takes some time to pick up the first hit and it takes some time to pick up the second hit. In some cases, you may never pick up that second hit. You may get really lucky and you may never pick that second hit up. If you're extraordinarily unlucky, you may pick up both hits within a few decades, right? It's all random. You don't know if you're gonna be a lucky one or an unlucky one, okay? So that's kind of where this, uh, where this gets to. So the other one, the proto-onca gene, I wanna basically sort of sketch this one up because I'm gonna basically write the same system. So you basically have your cell division coding region. Your start site, you've got your promoter, and then you've got your regulatory region, you've got your big old tumor suppressor sitting there, turning it off. And an oncogene, it's a little bit different because an oncogene, the nature of the mutation that occurs isn't in your regulator like it was before in the tumor suppressor. It's actually in the gene itself. So there's some sort of a mutation that occurs in the gene itself. And what this does is it basically throws this thing into a stuck on state. Regardless of your control. Now, because this is sort of in a stuck on state, you have no way of controlling it. This usually comes across as a dominant negative. I mean, specifically speaking, I don't know that we've ever actually found a dominant positive, to be quite honest with you. Uh, usually if you have a dominant mutation like this, which is a disease allele, it's almost never good, right? It's always bad news, um, but it's dominant because it pretty well takes over essentially. So it doesn't really matter whether or not you have tumor suppressor or not, because now what's happening is you're essentially running the show. You're not listening anymore. Uh, I like to think of these two mechanisms as um, defining sort of the regulation and the circumvention of regulation in a room full of toddlers. So imagine you got a room full of toddlers, and of course, nobody has a room full of toddlers unless there is some adult supervision in that room, right? But imagine you have this one really bad toddler, and this toddler wants to kill their sibling. That's pretty bad, right? That's usually frowned on, right? So what's keeping this toddler from killing their sibling? the adult in the room, right? So here's the toddler, like, you know, I wanna kill my sibling. This is, this is non-negotiable. The sibling's gonna be dead by the end of the day. Um, so how do I do this, right? First of all, I can't do it because I've got Mr. Boss Man over here telling me I can't do it for some reason, right? Even though my sibling just took my toy and they have to die for this, right? That's the extreme world of, of the toddler. <laughs> Luckily, they don't have enough mental wherewithal to figure out how to kill the sibling. So it just ends up being a slap or a punch or something like that. Yeah, that's how that comes across. Right. So basically, in this case, if you've got an authority figure in the room telling you, no, you can't kill your sibling. And that's a problem. Then what do you do? Well, there's two pathways you can do to get to get to the killing, killing your sibling. Number one is you can, first of all, remove the authority figure. It's like, oh, fine, fine. You want to tell me no? Then guess what? I'm going to kill you first. So if I take you down, Mr. Hotshot, then there's not going to be anybody in the room telling me what I can and can't do. Is there now? So what do you do? You go over there and you slap <laughs> the, uh, the caretaker. Because, well, that's just the, that's all you've got when you're a toddler. I mean, half of your skeleton is still cartilage anyway. So I mean, what, what can you actually do? Um, I mean, there's really not much you can do. So for you, that's killing, right? I just killed you, you're dead. Stop telling me no, right? Right, so that's one way to do it. Remove the adult from the room and you're free to do whatever you wish. That's exactly what the tumor suppressors do. As a matter of fact, what we see in a lot of cancers is exactly that. When a cancer cell, which is a rogue toddler, wants to do whatever it wants to do and doesn't want to be told no, one of the things that it oftentimes does is it will identify the adults in the room and eliminate them. 
you could do it that way. The alternative would be do it the proto-oncogene way. In this case, as a toddler, you're kind of like a little bit more radioactive here. In this case, and it's probably a little bit more accurate to, to what a toddler would actually do, especially a strong willed one, right? In this case, it's like, you know what? I hear you, but I'm going to kill my sibling anyway. See, I'm killing them in front of you. I can hear you saying no, but I'm not listening. So what happened? You mutated into a dominant negative form where you're doing whatever you want to do, which is stuck on kill, 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 right? That's, that's, a, that's a pretty bad toddler. Um, I'd probably be talking to the parents at that point, right? Be like, you might want to know if you think about this lovely little creature. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Don't turn your back on them. That sort of thing. Well, anybody who has a toddler knows that you never turn your back on them anyway, because um, nothing ever good happens. But, right, that's basically their dominant negative. They're sort of stuck in an on state. And what are they doing? They're ignoring instruction. Is instruction there to be heard? Yeah, it is. You can actually hear the person saying, stop, stop hurting your sibling. Stop slapping your brother, right? Because, again, you know, toddlers don't really have the wherewithal to know how to kill very well. So that, they get that later in public school. By the way, sorry. There's a reason I homeschool my kids. Um, don't, I, I'm not even going to start. I'm not even going to start. Don't even get me started. Right, so that's kind of what it is. And notice, all the regulation is still there, isn't it? The tumor suppressors are telling them, stop, stop, stop. But they are deaf to instruction. They're stuck on. So they become dominant negative. Right? So those are very dangerous dangerous genes um, and they're very ugly genes. So let's take a look at what kind of tumor suppressors do we have? Well, here's, a, here's one, here's one of my favorites, P53. It's a very inglorious name for a very important protein. Um, so P53 is basically just named because of its size. So when they were working on this, they were working on tumor suppressors. Do you have the ability to suppress a tumor, yes or no? Well, here's one and it's about 53 kilodaltons. So this is protein P53. That's where it comes from. So it's not a sexy name. That doesn't really, there's nothing juicy about that one. This is actually a G1 checkpoint. It also has activity pretty much all throughout D2 as well. But basically what uh, GSP53 does is monitor the integrity of the DNA. It actually has three really big jobs that it does. One of those is DNA repair. And along with DNA repair, it'll also be an activator. It's a, what's called a transcription factor for other cell division genes. So it actually has some input on other genes as they are going about their business in cell division. So that makes it like a, a boss, right? So like a middle manager, maybe not the top dog, but certainly has a, a little bit of say about how people do things. And then the third major branch that it has is a process called apoptosis, right? Apoptosis, which sounds like you're popping popcorn, is basically better understood as cell death. So here's how it works. When you have damaged DNA, where we said we are gonna damage the DNA, either because you're making a lot of mistakes in replication or because you've incurred a lot of insult from your environment, either way, either one will do that. Then what happens is you trigger a DNA repair mechanism to clean up this DNA. That's exactly what P53 is doing. P53 is telling the DNA repair proteins, um, you guys grab your mops and go clean the mess up on aisle six because you got a train wreck of DNA over there. So you better go fix that. And guess what? We're going to sit right here and we're going to wait while you do that. Notice what he does is it halts, stops cell division. So it's like an arrest, right? Like a checkpoint kind of a thing going on there, right? So it's like, okay, I'm going to wait. And none of that, but guess what? You're on the clock. You got mop in hand, you got your bucket, you're heading toward aisle six, I'm timing you. 
get it done in five minutes or you're being left behind because we're leaving. Right? Sounds like our home. <laughs> it's like, go to the bathroom, get your shoes on in five minutes and you're staying here and everybody else is gone. And the bathroom got right up. So it'd be a little weird to have your six year old at home alone. Maybe not with standing. What is the word? Division. Oh, apoptosis. Gene. For other cell division gene. So it activate. It's an activator for it. Yes, it's an activator for it. So it turns them on and off, basically. So here you are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And normally, what happens is if you've gone through a normal cycle of just basic wear and tear, your DNA damage should be fairly light. So it should be more than easy to be able to clean that DNA up. However, if you just got walloped by some sort of mutagen and you got DNA damage everywhere, then it's gonna take you a while, right? And P53 is all like, you know what? I hate to tell you this, but it's taken you a way too long to clean this DNA up. So if it's taking you this long, there's two situations that are going on here. Neither of them are good. Number one, either you can't fix it. You don't know how to fix the damage. That's intolerable. Do it right or, right? The other one is even though you do know how to fix it, you've got so much damage here that you're talking, this is not worth it, right? So that's also intolerable. Either way, if you're taking too long, what happens is P53 switches from DNA repair and triggers apoptosis, basically ordering the cell to kill itself. Again, why? Because it is preferable for the cell to die than for it to limp along one generation after another, half complete. Okay. So you can imagine then that cancer cells who are notorious for accumulating damage don't really like to be told what to do, do they? They pick up a mutation, P53 says, you know what, you're not fixing that, why don't you kill yourself? And the cancer cell, like the angry toddler says, you know what, how about I kill you? How about that as a solution? And if I kill you, then I can do whatever I want. As a result, what we oftentimes see is in many cancers, it's like nearing 50% actually have a mutation in P53. Literally just that. You've taken out the, the daycare worker, the adult in the room. By the way, if you want to know just how bad this can get, um, there's a lot of great analogies here. Kids are a great as an analogy for this one. Um, if you want to know just how bad kids can get, in the absence of the guardian, um, read Lord of the Flies. How many of you guys have read that book? Great, great book. I mean, it basically is social commentary on essentially what we will become if we don't have some sort of a guiding compass or a moral pathway, essentially. You're literally devolved from well-heeled cadet private school students to basically on the brink of cannibalism. And uh, that's basically kids in a nutshell, right? I mean, it's always managed cannibalism, <laughs> especially if you've ever seen two brothers fight. It's like, um, okay, I know you're still young, but you don't realize this, but you guys actually are on the same team. So you need to like, act like it and put your brother's eyeball back in the socket. Could you? It's like, Disgusting to see it hanging out there by the optic nerve. But anyway, that's, uh, I never really fought that much with my brother, but luckily my son is an only boy, but he's got two older sisters. So you can imagine what that's like. He still doesn't know yet that he can't just haul off after his sisters. He's still learning that one the hard way. Yeah, right. It's like, hey, this is 21st century. It's like, okay, stop. <laughs> Stop. Okay. And then is the middle kid, the 
old youngest sister is almost as bad as him because she'll be like she'll start it she'll like you nail know, and then he'll just and it's you guys come on it's like and it, we have to have like crap you know they both have to have their own little timeout section like their own little personal it's like okay i can't put you both in the same corner because you won't come out alive so yeah you get creative there when you have to pretty much send the entire family to a corner anyway that's my problem though yours Okay, so this one looks scary, yes? I know what you're thinking. Please tell me to memorize that. No, you don't have to memorize this. So this is one of those ones where I wanna kind of pull out the big broad brush strokes to kind of underpin everything we've been talking about, right? So we've been talking about kinases um, as basically the um, activator that turns on all of these signaling cascades. And we talked a little bit about PDGF, right? The growth factor, which is the external signal, which is talking to these cells and telling these cells whether or not um, they need to divide, yes or no. Um, and so this is kind of an example of, sort of pulling all, all together. So here you can see this, and I just want to sort of outline this. So here's an example of the PDGF, right? It's basically both a receptor. So you can see your growth factor here um, attaching to your receptor component. And then it's also an active kinase down here. So you can see an enzymatic domain down here which is a kinase, which will phosphorylate other proteins. And then by phosphorylating those proteins, you're gonna be turning them on, right? Or off, depends on, depends on what the protein is. And so here you can actually see this, right? So for instance, this phosphor, this, uh, this uh, um, receptor tyrosine kinase is basically going to, when it's activated by the growth factor, is going to activate this molecule called RAS, which is going to turn on. And then RAS is going to activate RAF, which is going to phosphorylate MEC, and turn it on, which is gonna phosphorylate ERK, which is gonna turn it on, which is then gonna go into the nucleus and it's gonna phosphorylate retinoblastoma RB, which will then activate retinoblastoma and cause it to split from its partner, which is E2F. Now E2F will then float off and actually turn on other cyclins, which we learned about last time, and also other types of proteins that are involved in different facets of cell cycle, S phase and things like that. Okay retinoblastoma becomes a transcription factor, which basically activates other cell division genes. And it is itself a tumor suppressor. So if you didn't catch any of that, <coughs> first of all, I want to mention that I do apologize because uh, what happened last time, if you tried to log on and were not able to, is uh, we had a double blow up. Uh, the room technology caved in on us and Zoom basically caved in on us at the same time. So the lecture on Monday was old school, me and the whiteboard and a marker. So I'm sure you, the folks who were actually here loved that. Um, Jamie's probably thinking, yeah, no, not so much. Uh, 21st century is a good thing. Um, but that's kind of where some of this backfill story is. I haven't posted any videos for a while yet, but we do have an exam cycle coming up next Wednesday. And so one of the things I want to do in the next few days is to get those lectures caught up. And then for our missing lecture, which was the last one, I'll probably use the lecture from the Monday, Wednesday morning class to sort of fill that in, fill that gap in. And you might actually even hear our singer because that's the class that it happened in. But anyway. Wednesday? Next Wednesday. Yep. Which should cover um, it should cover five, ten, and eleven. So I think we should get a pretty good, healthy start on eleven uh, for the most part. Um, right now, because of that little debacle on Monday, we went from being the section that was ahead to the section that is now in the rear. So. Like the first and second exam, so it's a full lecture exam. So um, that's basically what we're talking about. Now, the other thing I also want to notice is basically notice that when you're talking about this, um, any one of these, if you have a mutation in any one of these, you're going to foul up this signal, right? Because the overall signal is just to turn these genes on. That's the overall final message. But you have multiple layers, like a grapevine situation, happening here. And any one of these layers, if they get stuck on, can act like an oncogene, okay? Because they're constantly gonna be sending signal and they're not gonna sort of back off and say like, okay, I need to send a signal now and then I need to back off. 
So this is basically the proteins or the genes that we usually recovered as oncogenes and tumor suppressors when we studied cancer. Okay. So it's a fundamental breakdown of cell cycle. So proto-oncogenes, remember basically we are stuck in the on state and so we cannot back that off and we're not listening to instructions. And so we have this unregulated um, cell cycle division, which pretty much means we can do whatever we want. And as a, as a tumor, you can basically accumulate whatever you want because you're just plowing forward. So we already talked about P53 as a tumor suppressor gene. Another tumor suppressor gene that we actually discovered was RB itself. That was actually the first one. We actually discovered that one first before P53. And the way we discovered it is because retinoblastoma is actually a condition. It's actually a type of cancer. It's retinal cancer. And typically what happens is we see this retinal cancer in like little babies. And so they come out blind. And so what we noticed was that in a lot of um, babies with retinoblastoma is they came out already with the predisposition. So what does that mean? So a predisposition basically means that you already inherit a mutant copy of RB. So you're already one down. Now, normally in a situation like that, we have a predisposition like this, then it only takes you to catch that last one before you start having problems. Normally, in like most cancers, if you do have this, it's like you, you might pick that other one up in your 20s or 30s, right? So that's when you have that early age onset of cancer occurring. Breast cancer, for instance, is a good example of that, where you have a predisposition, but then you start to get that cancer development like in your second, third decade of life. So it's a little bit earlier than most uh, progressions. But in this case, it was actually really quick because what happened was because of the retina, the retina is constantly exposed to UV radiation. Um, and so that increases the amount of radioactive insult, right? The, the amount of mutagenic insult on the actual retina itself. So it's actually, you accumulate that mutation much, much faster because your retina is exposed to UV radiation because you're just like, you know, your pupil is just a hole and the light is going through it. And so, that's the reason why we saw these little kids becoming blind because they picked up that second copy rather quickly. Okay. And they, they tend to be rather, well, obviously unlucky. Now, is it possible that you can go into a little bit of age before picking that one up? Yeah. But usually it ranged between like little babies with retinoblastoma to up into teenage years before they started developing retinoblastoma. And it's not like right away, right? So your blindness doesn't just like, okay, I picked up my second hit. You know, it's like, I just turned the lights off. It's not like that, right? It's like kind of a progressive deterioration of the retina over time. And so it'd be similar to the way Beethoven's deafness worked, right? Kind of that sort of long-term progressive deterioration of effect. And that's kind of how that occurs. And so um, that's kind of where we picked up that, that first one, where we first started understanding um, how these tumor suppressors work in order to keep that off. And that's, uh, that was unfortunate, but that's how we learned, right? We learned, we learned most of these lessons from the diseases that we have. Um, and that's how we learn things. We, we're not very good at learning things like when they're working well. We're only good at learning things when they stop working. And then we figure out what's missing. And then we learn a little something about it. Okay. That's kind of unfortunate, right? It's kind of like the old adage, right? You never, you never realize how important somebody was to you until they're gone. And that's pretty, that's classic. That's classic human, right? So, okay. Chapter 11. Let's do this. So a couple of things I want to um, scale out with chapter 11, right? So just like with chapter 10, that was our first reproduction chapter, only if you're single celled. If you're multi celled now, um, you're also, uh, this is now your reproduction chapter. So this is for us now. So finally, we get to go to our reproduction chapter. But there's two different ways that you can reproduce. Now, the, the, this, this chapter is sexual reproduction and meiosis. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Now, one of the things that um, I like to use chapter 11 uh, for is to prep. Um, for chapter 12. Um, so rather than just looking at meiosis as just like a cell division thing, 
Um, a lot of times you're going to see a lot of common themes that we've already picked up in chapter 10. A lot of times students will be like, wait a minute, why do we have a separate chapter on this one? Because it seems like there's a lot of overlap here and a lot of redundancy. So why do we have a separate one? I don't treat it like it's like a separate thing. I treat meiosis as very much sort of like a pre-work pre to uh, understanding the underpinnings of genetics, right? So I like to look at this chapter as defining and laying the groundwork, the foundational work that'll set us up for what we're trying to learn about and what we're trying to create and craft in chapter 12 with genetics and inheritance. Okay. The first stopping point to crafting that foundation is basically defining a reason for doing it in the first place. There's a couple of ways that you can actually um, reproduce. You can do it asexually or you can do it sexually, right? And so what I want to do, and this is going to be a little bit of class participation, is I want to list some pros and cons for each. Now, basically speaking, uh, with asexual reproduction, this is just a, to, for, you know, to make it short, this is basically just a clonal process. You're essentially making a carbon copy of yourself genetically. Um, and so there's like no variation um, or at all. So you just kind of like just rubber stamp yourself, just make a copy of yourself and, and there there's two of you in the world, right? Um, and of course, with sexual reproduction, I assume we largely are familiar with the, the basic underpinnings of sexual reproduction. We have probably all been uh, to and beyond the whole birds and the bees talk. Um, and some of us have certainly tested out the theory, <laughs> so to speak, um, on occasion. So we're well acquainted with the nuances of what's involved with sexual reproduction, things of that nature. So when you look at both of them, and you can start anywhere you want, give me either a pro or a con for either asexual or sexual reproduction. It's yours. Uh, for asexual, you don't have to find a partner. And why is that good? Yeah, it takes energy, you're right. right. So since it's a pro for the asexual side, right? For the sexual side, it would be what? It'd be a con, why? Because on the con, you have to talk somebody into it, right? And also as for the energy thing, on the flip side of it, it also, takes energy over here. Um, let me restate this one. Doesn't take energy, right? Or less energy. Any other pros or cons? So that would be a con, right? So vulnerable during division. So that would be a pro on the flip side for sexual, right? So you'd be protected. During division. Okay. being able to mix genes. And what about asexual in that regard? So no new genes, so that'd be a con, right? Anything else? It's a good list. So looking at this, it seems like it should be a bit of a draw, yes? Like if you didn't know anything about the world, wouldn't you guess that I'm thinking there's probably maybe 
half of the biological organisms are asexual, maybe half of them are sexual. But is that what we see? No, the overwhelming dominant format is sexual, right? Like not even close. Why? I mean, first of all, doesn't it seem like for you minimalists, doesn't it seem like asexual is powerfully efficient? Isn't it like attractive? It's like, this is very attractive to me. This is like, you cut to the chase, you get to the bottom line, right? Just make a copy of myself and we're good to go, boom. So if it's so brutally efficient, then how come it's not dominant? What are we missing? What? Yeah, which goes along with the gene mixing idea. Right? And the no new genes idea on the asexual side. So think about it this way. I always like to think, uh, and, and by the way, I mean, you can see this, right? I mean, obviously, I mean, it's, it's not a small thing where you don't need somebody versus you need somebody. I mean, that's a huge drawdown on sexual reproduction, right? The fact that you need to talk somebody into doing this is a massive negative, right? Think about it. How easy it is it to talk somebody into this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not talking about just like, you know, half drunk one night stand. I don't even remember your name, much less your face kind of a thing. That's not what we're talking about here. Right. We're talking about reproduction. Right. Exactly. Humans, I would argue, take even longer. Right. How easy is it? Is it easy? No, you know how it's you know how you know that? You've got entire industries wrapped around us, don't you? Things like Match.com and eHarmony and, and throw in whatever you want, right? I mean, most clubs are basically just hookup joints, right? Uh, you know, that's, so there's a lot that goes into that, right? The entire culture of being single and trying to find somebody. And like you said, it's not just finding somebody. Most of us can probably end up drawing a short straw and end up with somebody right but that's not what it's about is it because you're not just trying to end up with somebody you're trying to actually trying to figure out whether or not this somebody is somebody that you want to actually add to the next generation with right there's a there's a lot going on there so this by the way wraps and all that but for animals and for us, it's, it's just kind of cute and funny, right? Because we got all these hookup sites and things like that and this entire culture of, of dating and, and, and meeting and greeting and all that sort of stuff. But for animals, they have the same thing. It's mate selection, right? We've all heard of natural selection. That's survival of the fittest, right? The predator basically picking you out and chewing on you because you're bright and fluorescent pink. That one's easy to wrap your head around. But a lot of times what people don't realize is that mate selection also has a very powerful effect, especially on evolution or the passage of traits on from one generation to the next, right? And mate selection is enormous, right? This is the reason why, like, if you take a look at the peacock, you know, the dude with the brightest, prettiest feathers is the one that gets all the girls. Not because he's choosing them, but because he's being chosen, right? And that's oftentimes, I love the way you, you mentioned birds, is because birds are famously sexually dimorphic, which means that they've got a very colorful gender and a very not so much uh, colorful gender, right? And who is the colorful one? It's the males. Why? Not because they're sexist. I mean, they're birds for crying out loud. I mean, there's no such thing as sexism in an animal for crying out loud. They're animals, right? I actually heard that once. I'm like, are you kidding me? Seriously. An animal isn't sexist. They're an animal for crying out loud. Um, they're just doing what their instinct tells them to do. But anyway, right? The reason why the male is colorful is why? Is because he's trying to win the girl. He's trying to get bigger, more colorful, you know, more you know, impressive. He's trying to get the bigger rack of antlers. He's trying to get the bigger muscles. Does this sound familiar? 
All you have to do is go into a locker room somewhere and you see this on full display, right? Go to a gym when all the, when all the, the, the studs are, are busy drooling over themselves in the mirror. You can see this on full display. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. And honestly, the females are doing the same thing, right? Just a different set of feathers and that sort of thing. That's pure instinct. That's pure mate selection. That's pure animal. That's all that is. Okay. What are we doing? What we're doing is we're trying to basically attract the mate. And there's a lot that goes into that. Think about it. The reason why I say that is not because of these psychosocial stuff, right? Like all the websites and things like that. That's just human. What I, what I want you to understand is how much biology is going into this. Right, so you actually have an entire life that exists as a colorful bird for the purpose of selecting mate, getting the mating down. So this is just an example of how much energy it goes into sexual reproduction. So that's a big deal. That's a huge, huge drag. So think about all that energy that goes into that, all of that. Uh, by the way, let's add another negative to that one. If you are bright and colorful, who do you think the predator is going to go after first? Yeah, right. It's you know it's kind of that's it's kind of the way I think of gym rats, right? I mean, if you've got like like massive muscles, who do you think the aliens are going to carve up for Thanksgiving dinner first? Not as scrawny types, right? I mean, we're all bone and connective tissue, right? <laughs> we'll be turned into rawhides for their dogs. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, it's devolving now, right? So I just basically have, we're all getting eaten by alien, cannibalistic aliens. That's a new low for me, by the way, just like I'm just saying, um, or high, actually I've been lower, but anyway, um, <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of all kind of bundled into this, right? So there's an enormous amount of energy that's associated with this. <clears throat> and it's a huge drag. So that's a negative, right? So you're basically colorful. Good job. You're going to get all the girls, but guess what? You're probably going to be the first one to get eaten too, right? So there's a, a price to pay for being the colorful one. And so that's the reason why I say birds aren't sexist because there's actually a biological purpose for their color, coloration. It's not just him trying to win the girl. It's also the female bird. Usually in colors like that, the female bird is the caretaker. Um, and sometimes the male will assist, depends on the bird species. But the reason why the female is brown is because the last thing you wanna do is have like a little brood of little eggs, chicks that just hatched that are super, super vulnerable. And to be brightly fluorescent red with a big old sign on your head saying, here, eat me. I got vulnerable little babies here, right? That's not good strategy. That's the reason why oftentimes when you see a dimorphic colorful male with a drab female, that's a, a pattern species where the female is the dominant caretaker in that group. Where you see non-dimorphism, oftentimes the duties are shared between the two males and the females. And it, yeah, right, exactly. And then there's one species that I know of where it's flipped, where the female's colorful and not the male. Uh, the belted kingfisher is an example of that. So she has a little bit more color on her than the male does. The, the belted kingfisher. Is that a bird? Yeah, oh. yeah, it's a waterfowl. They're around here. You can actually hear them. They kind of had a kind of sound like that. You can hear them flying around and they like to fly around like creeks and rivers and things like that. I can hear them. They kind of got like a little Bart Simpson hairdo, and like a little stout, and then they got like a little V right there on their neck. One is blue, and then the female has a little red one underneath that, like a reddish colored one, where the male just has the blue one. But that was neither here nor there. That's ornithology. That was for free. But anyway, right? So the idea then is if you're a sitting duck and you're colorful and you're taking all this energy to wrap all this biology into mate selection, then there better be a darn good reason for you to see wasting all this time and energy and to do all this so what is that payback it's very
variation. What's the importance of variation? Let me just kind of sketch it out for you at a place where you live. Let's take an exam right now. I'm gonna start with Gretel. So I'm gonna take an exam, I'm gonna give it to you, but I'm gonna give you the key. I'm gonna say, go ahead and take the exam. So what are you gonna do? Just, just fill out the key, right? I mean, would you change anything? I mean, it's a good key, right? I mean, I promise it's a good key. You're like, so you just basically fill out the answers. And of course, then how would you do? You'd be great, you get like 100%. So then let's say, I say, okay, girl, go ahead and send it on to Madam, right? And then the same thing, you give her the key, give her the exam, and what do you do? Yeah, just do this exact same thing, right? And if you hand it on to Jamie, what would you do? Same thing, right? Notice what's happened. You've got an environment, the exam, and you've got an answer set, a solution to the environment, the key. Is there any reason to change that? As long as the environment stays the same, why change success? In that circumstance, asexual is the way to go. Here's the problem. Now let's go ahead and pass the exam to Kelsey. But instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the exam. I'm gonna give you a different one. And not only that, but it's an exam for something that we're not even close to study. Let's say music theory. Now, if you're a musician, don't cheat, right? So this is like, just like you're a non-musician, you have no idea about music theory. It's like, I don't know, I don't even play an instrument or whatever, right? So this is, and now you have to take this exam, but all you've got is the key. How are you gonna do? Yeah, right, because your answers don't match your environment. Why? Because I changed the environment. So what are your choices? You really don't have two, don't you? Basically, either mutate or die. What's more likely gonna happen? Are you gonna mutate and you're gonna be saved? No. Why? Because mutation rates are very slow. You might get one or two beneficial ones every, what, half a million years or so. You need that answer now. Chances of getting that are pretty slim. So you really only have one choice, don't you? Die. Just like with the exam, Kelsey really only has two choices. Either she can mutate, that's like guess. Just, let's just, I'm just gonna randomly guess and hope that there's enough of those guesses that breaks her way that she can pass the exam. Is that likely? If she, if, if, it, if she passes the exam doing that, then she needs to play the lottery, right? More than likely what's gonna happen, she's gonna fail, right? Those are the two options. Now, that's asexual. Notice asexual only works if your environment stays the same. As soon as I change it on you, you're kind of screwed, aren't you? So you'd have to mutate or die. And that's where asexual lives. Let's ask the question, how would the sexual have changed? Here's how sexual works. Because in sexual reproduction, you're adding variation. Variation is like knowledge. So in the case of variation, let's say I change the exam on Kelsey, but instead of her just taking it cold, what she has now is like a lot of time studying music theory. So let's say now I give her a lot of resources, a lot of lectures and a lot of work studying music theory. Every time she's learning something new about music theory, she's adding to her reservoir of knowledge. That's like her knowledge variation. So when I change up the exam on her, now it's not so cold. Could she do poorly? Yes, but at least for every question she's got now, she's got a fighting chance. Why? Because she sees this question and she's like, wait a minute, I don't have the answer to this, right? First of all, let's just say it. the key is useless, I'm throwing it out. Now the only thing I can do is dig deep into my reservoir, my well of information, and hopefully I can pick out something that will help me answer this question. The more I have in my well, the more chances I have to answer the question correctly. That's the reason why in sexual reproduction, the more variation you have, the more you're gonna be able to answer all those hard questions that the environment 
throws at you. Why? Because the environment is always constantly changing, right? Just when you get comfortable throwing the curve, the dude, you know, smokes a, a, a fastball right down the middle. Totally didn't look for that one because you were looking for an off-speed pitch. And so here you are just standing there like a dope and the catcher's already got the ball. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, my timing was off for that one, right? And then here you are taking the long walk back to the dugout. One of the reasons why I don't like, why I didn't like playing baseball is I just didn't like being out there like the only one where you could like, okay, if I screw up, everybody's going to see it, you know it. And there's nothing I can do, but that long, lonely walk back to the dugout before I can hide from everybody. Uh, that's why I was always much more attracted to football. At least you can kind of hide behind your teammates. You know, even if you made the mistake, just yell at your buddy, right? You're like, it was his fault. Nobody would know the difference. You're like, wait a minute, I'm the one who blew the coverage, not you. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at sexual reproduction, right? So this, now we know why, right? We know why we have sexual reproduction as a dominant theme because we need a lot of variation. And so what is our variation? Instead of information, what our variation is, is genetics, right? Our genetic information is what basically saves us. And we have a deep pool and reservoir for variation. And unfortunately, especially, um, and this is a very genetic way of looking at things. One of the biggest beefs I have actually um, in evolution is because quintessentially evolution is a genetic problem. Right, you're talking about species changing over time. How do they change? Their genetics changes over time. So unless you talk about evolution as genetics, then you're not really talking about evolution. Um, that's the reason why you know, when I look at paleontology, it's just basically a giant rock zoo. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. It's just the zoo and rocks. Um, so it doesn't really do anything, right? Because you have to talk genetics to really understand what's happening. Um, with all of us in the short term, which is traditional genetics, just a few generations here or there, or in the long term, which is where we start to get to speciation and evolution and things of that nature. But it's all the same process. The idea, the same genetic principles that we struggle with now, as we are the descendants of family and will have family, perhaps many of us, some of us, it's the same mechanism that got us here in the first place from millennia eons ago right so the common denominator to all of that fossils notwithstanding is throughout all of it is genetics so to understand how it all works is really requires you to understand genetics and sexual reproduction is part of that story so let's take a look then um most of us animals that is are sexually reproducing there's not many of us that are asexual Right, because we need that deep well of, of variation. And oftentimes in evolution, we tend to talk way, way too much about mutation and not enough about variation. Um, <coughs> now, of course, I know, I know, I know. You're probably thinking, well, where did the variation come from in the first place? Well, of course, that was, you know, that's, but oftentimes in evolution, you usually talk in terms of near term, like maybe from the evolution of the family level of taxonomy down. Okay. So let's take a look at sexual life cycles. So sexual life cycles basically are an oscillation between the diploid state which we learned about in the last chapter between diploid and haploid. Right? So diploid we know, we've already defined that one, right? So this is basically a state where you have two of every chromosome, of course, haploid, you only have one of every chromosome. And then for us, because we've got 23 unique chromosomes, that's our haploid state, that means we have 46 chromosomes in every single one of our cells. And of course, where do we get those two sets from? Well, we get one from mom and we get one from dad, right? So that's where they come from. And so this idea of diploid and haploid is something that actually underpins the life cycle of all organisms, um, especially of all animals. And this is uh, basically what you got, right? So you basically have a haploid sperm with 23 chromosomes in it, which then fuses with a haploid egg from the female. 
with 23 chromosomes in it. And then the two fuse together. So the male sperm will fuse with the female egg. And then the male pronucleus will fuse with the female pronucleus, creating a zygotic nucleus of 46, right? Now, if you're keeping track, what you just got was the birds and the bees talk, the express version, granted, but an alternate version of the birds and the bees talk. A lot of those in biology. Okay, so let's take a look then at our life cycle. So the life cycle of most animals, for instance. So most of our reality is basically spent in the diploid state. So that basically means that we have a diploid body. So if you look in the mirror, what you're looking at is a diploid structure. Every single one of your body cells, red blood cells notwithstanding, because they don't have a nucleus for different reasons that you'll learn about in AMP2, if you get there. Um, but all of your cells in your body have a diploid number of cells. So they have 46 chromosomes in them. Okay. The only cells that have a haploid state are your germline cells, which forms your haploid gametes, right? This is basically your sperm and your eggs. So our cycle is dominated by the diploid. And the amount of time we spend in the haploid state is very, very brief, right? We can see that on this particular image. So you can see here, we start off with the zygote, where the zygote, which is a diploid, will go through mitosis to create your diploid body, right? You're still diploid here. And then a subset of your, your cells will be set aside as germline cells, which will, when you mature, will become the progenitors of your gametes. For instance, in the females, the um, oocytes will come from the ovaries. They will go through meiosis and they'll produce the haploid egg. And the males and the testes, they'll go through meiosis to produce the haploid sperm. When the sperm and the egg unite, then 23 plus 23 equals 46 and you get the zygote of the next generation. However, how long does the haploid state last? It's very short. Think about this for a second. A female will ovulate an egg every roughly-ish, every month or so, right? Generally speaking, as soon as she goes through the menstrual cycle and she sloughs off her uterine lining, then off goes the egg as well. And then you reset the system to call up the next egg for development. So at best, you're talking about roughly a 30-ish or so day cycle where you have this sort of recurring cycle of follicular development, ovulation of the egg itself, where the egg then sits and waits to be fertilized. Well, either it is or it isn't, right? So if there is no mating event, then there is no sperm around to uh, fertilize the egg. Um, the uterine lining, which during that time has thickened up and become very vascular in anticipation of implantation of a newly fertilized embryo, will realize, wait a minute, there's no embryo coming and therefore will detach and slough off along with the egg. And then you reset the system for the next month. Males, when you're talking about sperm turnover, roughly will produce a batch of sperm in about every 24-ish or so hours, at least a complete turnover of sperm. Not only that, but sperm outside of the body is, uh, doesn't last for very long. Right, because there's no there's no nucleus associated with the sperm. There's nothing to keep it alive. Right. Literally, it's just kind of like a little wind-up toy. That's basically what the so it's got like a bunch of mitochondria in it that are kind of like just allow the, the energy that's in the wind-up. And then basically just kind of goes. And then once it winds down, each of those mitochondria will die off and then eventually it'll stop swimming and then it'll be great. Okay. They have to freeze it. If you, if you freeze it, you can maintain it. Uh, you, it has to be pretty fresh um, because you start to lose motility very quickly. And if you don't have modal sperm, 
yeah, it's, it's a type of infertility, right? But basically it doesn't last very long uh, because it doesn't have anything associated with it to, to, that most cells have to kind of keep it alive long-term, right? I mean, all sperm is, is basically a little genetic grenade. That's all it is. It's just like a little wad of DNA, just a little bit of protein to sort of encapsulate the DNA and a tail with some energy. That's it. It's just a little, it's a little genetic grenade, it's a little DNA bomb is what it is. Um, all the stuff that you associate with all the cell, the living parts of the cell are all provided by mom, right? So it's the egg and she puts a lot of investment in this egg, by the way, just letting you know, right? So there's a lot of investment in this egg. So all those organelles that you need, uh, including your mitochondria um, and uh, anything else like uh, your ER and all that sort of stuff, all of those things are all supplied and provided by mom. The only thing dad provides is just DNA. That's it. It's a straightforward DNA transfer. So you really don't get much from dad, right? Cell wise. <laughs> a lot of you guys are like, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true when we get older too <laughs> right so that's kind of like the thing so we don't spend very much time here however not all organisms are like us right some organisms actually have a haploid body this is a little crazy this is what we refer to as alternation of generations so what does that mean that means you oscillate between the haploid and the diploid state so you actually have a haploid body in this case. So let's take a look at moss. It's a good example. In moss, you have a little body, a multicellular body that's a diploid. And we call this one a sporophyte. So this is a diploid body. What happens is you create like a little sporangium, like a little stalk. And inside of it are cells that undergo meiosis and they create little haploid spores. And eventually what's gonna happen is it opens up and it spews these little spores all over the place. There's a little haploid spore. And what happens is that little haploid spore goes through mitosis, many rounds of mitosis, and creates a little haploid body. Called a gametophyte. Then in order to produce your gametes, the gametophyte goes through, not meiosis, because you would have it, right? You go through mitosis to produce your gametes. So you produce a little haploid gamete, which you fuse with a haploid gamete from another individual. And when those two come together during fertilization, you create your diploid zygote which will then go through multiple rounds of mitosis to create the diploid sporophyte. <laughs> you like that one? So that's because you're, so yeah, you, that means you're not a botanist, right? So botany people would be like, I'm oh, so cool. Um, so this is, uh, this is what mosses do, right? And so if you think about it, it's a little on the crazy side, isn't it? We don't do any of this, but basically notice that their cycle is the same. They basically have roughly the same cycle. They got an alternation between the diploid state and the haploid state. And they produce gametes that are haploid and they go through mitosis to create their bodies, just like we do. So let's, and, and, the, and there's a reason why you do this. There's a little bit of an advantage here. We kind of approach it a little bit differently, but let's kind of imagine what would happen is if we had this alternation of of body types, right? So like, if you take a look at a moss out there, you could either be looking at a sporophyte, which is the diploid body, or you could be looking at the gametophyte, which would be a haploid body, the producer of the gametes. Let's take a look and see what would, it would look like in us if we did this same strategy. Here's how it would look. So let's go ahead and start off as a zygote, right? We go through mitosis, all that's the same. We create our diploid body, that would be like the sporophyte. Right. We have a subset of cells that go through meiosis. That's all still the same. We produce the haploid cells, which are our gametes. But in this case, now these are spores. So what would that look like for us? 
So instead of fusing our two gametes together quickly to get the fertilization, if we did this, what happened is our sperm and our eggs would actually go through mitosis. And then they'd go through multiple rounds of mitosis. And so they would create their own body. So what would happen is every male would have like these little half clones of people that grew up from their sperm. It's weird, right? But they would have half of your DNA, a different combination of that half of your DNA, right? But you would have it potentially, I mean, if you think about just how many hundreds of millions of sperm the average male produces, you could have hundreds of millions of little half clones running around out there. Females would have hundreds of millions of half clones of them running around there because their eggs would go through mitosis. And then what would happen is those half clones would then go through mitosis to create their gametes. So a subset of them would be like, okay, I'm going to send these two cells through mitosis and they're going to create the two cells. Their cells are going to become the gametes. And so we're going to fuse these together. That's going to become the zygote. And then that becomes the next generation to create the diploid body. It would look really weird, right? Because if we started off with us here, our first generation, then that means our kids wouldn't actually be kids. They would be half clones. So we wouldn't have actually technically reproduced yet. We wouldn't have reproduced until our half clones grew up, made gametes and infused with each other. And then the grandkids, so to speak, would actually be the culmination of the reproduction. Imagine what chaos that would create. I mean, we would have like all these different classes of humans. We'd have half clones all over the place. We'd probably have laws governing how we treat the half clones half clones are people too right um you know i mean we'd have all these bumper stickers it would be a cause there would be a thing right it'd be like star belly sneeches and plain belly sneeches right so i'm not a half clone i'm a full thing you know it's like i mean you can almost hear it happening right it's like i'm better than you because i've got all the dna you're just a half clone uh, i mean you could almost hear how we would work this out right it doesn't none of it usually goes well because that's just not the way we are, right? But that's kind of what it would be like. Now, why would we do that? What's the advantage of doing that? I mean, why would you make an alternate body that's happening? That seems to be weird, right? Well, here's the reason why. Think about it. We've done this, actually. We've probably heard this, actually. Like some of us have maybe made this comment or thought. Maybe this is our strategy. Some of us are like, you know, I want to have kids. But not right now. I want to go through school. I want to finish school first. I want to, I want to get my career off the ground. I want to, I want to make a little bit of money first, right? I want to, I want to make a bit of a life of it first. And then maybe when I'm 30 ish or something like that, I'll, I'll think about having kids, right? But I want to get my career first. That's exactly what these guys are doing. So what they're doing is they're saying, you know what? The circumstances that I'm in right now is not ideal for me to have kids in. I want a chance to work on my circumstances to improve my lot in life so that I have something to give to these kids once we actually get to that place, right? And so these guys are doing the same thing. So in this case, what's happening is like, you know what? The way I'm going to improve my lot in life is instead of basically having kids right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have half clones. And I'm going to spread these half clone spores all over the place. And some of these spores will land in really, really great areas really nice areas, right? That have a really nice environment, perfect conditions. And they are gonna be the ones who then finish off the reproduction. So that's kind of the strategy. Well, here what we do is we say, well, you know what? I'm gonna go find that new environment first. And once I find it, then I'm gonna have kids and bring the kids into this world, right? Notice we can do that, why? Because we got legs. If we don't like it over here, we can get up and we can walk over here. And we can be like, you know what? The grass is actually a little greener over here. Like in my neighbor's yard, for instance. Right. So it's not always true that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. If it's my lawn, it always is greener on the other side. Because I've got like six dogs and there's no such thing as grass at all when you've got six dogs. <laughs> Right, so in this case, you can't get up and walk if you're a moss. So the best thing you have is to disperse your spores 
throughout other environments. Hope you snag a good one and then let them finish out the reproductive process in better climate. Okay, okay let's take a look at meiosis itself as a mechanism. First of all, a couple of things about meiosis is there's an awful lot of sameness about meiosis and mitosis, right? So for the, they basically have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. That's all common between uh, meiosis and mitosis. The difference between mitosis and meiosis is meiosis has two steps to it. It's got meiosis one and meiosis two, and you're doing very two distinct things in each one of these. I'll come back to synapsis and talk about synapsis a little bit later. <coughs> In meiosis one, the first thing you're gonna be doing in meiosis one, which is called the reductional division, is so called because the goal of meiosis one is to separate homologs. So you're separating mom one from dad one, mom two from dad two, mom three from dad three. And that's the reason why it's called the reductional division because ultimately, you start off with two copies of each chromosome, but when you separate the homologs from each other, you get two piles of haploid cells. So that's what's happening in your reductional division. In your second meiotic division, basically you're separating out your sisters. Okay, that's your goal there. Uh, notice in between first and second, there's no DNA replication. This is not two cell divisions in sequence. This is one cell division with two steps. So there's not an intervening replication event going on in there. So if you take a look at meiosis two, this is what's referred to as the equational division. And the goal of this one is to basically separate the sisters. So you're going from a haploid to another haploid. And notice in each set, you've got basically the same phases, right? You've got a prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. And then you move into my meiosis two, and you got a prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two. Notice the absence of something. What's missing? Yeah, I remember this is the reason why I said that it's either a four or five phase system. It depends on what you're looking at. So the meiosis people are only looking at chromosomal dynamics and chromosomal segregation. They're not looking at microtubules. So they tend not to think about prometaphase, just about prometa and ana and telo, or just those four. So a couple of things that, that you see, I'm gonna come back to this one. In prophase, and it's a fair question, right? Because a lot of times there's a lot, of, I said there's a lot of sameness in this chapter relative to the last chapter, chapter 10. And so a lot of times students will be like, well, wait a minute, okay, there's a, a lot of the sameness is in this, then what exactly is different here, right? What sets meiosis apart? Why is it such a significant thing um, that we do here? Well, first of all, what I wanna do is I wanna basically sketch out the things that we already know about prophase and mitosis and uh, recapitulate those here in meiosis. So first of all, what are some of the things we know happen in prophase of mitosis? What happens? So the nuclear envelope in prophase will break down, right? But you're right, nuclear envelope. What else happens? I'm thinking about mitosis. So that's gonna be metaphase. Yep. Condensation, yep, right. So chromosome condensation. What else? Last one. This is always the hardest one. Huh? This, the, the Monday morning one had a problem with this one too. Yeah. 
spindle migration. Right, this is where your spindle migrates into its antipolar position, gets itself ready, your spindle forms, all those microtubules start to form their little birdcage-like structure. That's all mitosis. Is it all the same in meiosis one? Yes. Great. Have we learned anything new? No? You haven't told me anything new yet. So why am I impressed? Well, let's take a look at the innovations of meiosis. The next four are gonna be what meiosis only does. The first one is homologous pairing. So they basically become closely associated. So what does that mean? That means the mom one will find the dad one and pair up. That didn't happen in mitosis. After you find each other, then you go through what's called synapsis. So synapsis is basically the gluing together of the homologs. So in this case, you form a big protein structure in the middle, gluing these two guys together. This is called the synaptonemal complex. It glues the homologs together. And then once you glue these guys together, then you get what's called crossing over or recombination. Those are synonymous. And it forms these little X-like structures between them called chiasma. We'll take a look at that here in just a second. But what I wanna do is I wanna roll this back to this chromosome here. Because this is aligned homologs, right? So we have mom one, we have dad one, and we have our kinetic cores here. And there's another one right there underneath. You can see you've been replicated and you've also been zippered together. So this right here is your synaptonemal complex, this little protein network gluing the two sisters together. Then you form these X-like structures between these homologs, excuse me, like this, between these homologs. And those are the chiasma. These are physical crossover structures. None of that happens in mitosis. So why is that a big deal? Well, it is a big deal because what I wanna do is I want to insert the notorious slide. And what I wanna do is there's three main engines of variation. And in order to set up the genetics chapter to understand how you sort through and inherit variation, we wanna talk about how you get variation in the first place. There's three main engines of variations in meiosis. The first one that we're gonna talk about here is recombination. Or crossing over. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two chromosomes, we take a mom one and a dad one. So there is one sister chromatid attached to a centromere with your other sister chromatid up there. Dad one, there's your centromere, there's your other sister chromatid. So this represents your two homologs tethered together. By the way, just to let you go, just to remind you of something, I, I wanna mention this because I didn't mention this before, but when you have a fully paired and synapse set of homologs, they have two different names for this that you'll run into. One is called the tetrad because you got four, one, two, three, four sisters, or the bivalent or the bivalent because you got two homologs, right? So this 
this structure right here would be referred to as a tetrad. I hear tetrad more than bivalent. <coughs> but let's get back to this, shall we? Let's start off with the beginning mechanism of recombination. So typically recombination always starts with a double strand break, usually happening in both homologs like that. Now there's two different ways you can seal this double strand break. You can either seal it end to end, in which case you get nothing, no difference, right? So just basically all you're doing is you're just gluing these two ends back together and then you don't see anything. However, because they're homologs, you can actually seal one of these purple ends to the red end over here. And you can drop this purple end to this red end down here. If you were to do that, what you would create is a chiasma, which is a physical bridge or a crossover between two homo um, uh, homologous sisters. So I'm going to put in two of these guys, one over here too. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically fast forward meiosis. So I'm going to go through meiosis one first. And meiosis one, remember, we're separating the homologs. So we're going to separate these guys apart. And then I'm going to fast forward through meiosis two, which is going to be separating the sisters apart like that. Right? So here's what happens when you have these crossover events in there. First of all, in number one, you're going to have this particular chromosome, which is going to pick up the purple centromere. And it's going to go all the way through. So this particular product is going to look something like this. Now then, if I take a look at number two, I'm going to start off purple. And then as soon as I hit the crossover, I'm going to go over the bridge. And then I'm going to pick up the pink pick up the centromere for pink. Then I hit the second crossover. And I have to go over the bridge. And then I'm gonna pick up and finish off with purple. This one would look like this. Now for number three, I'm gonna start off with the pink. When I hit the crossover event, I'm going to go over the bridge. And then I'm going to hit the purple. I'm going to pick up the purple centromere. And then when I hit the next chiasma, I'm going to go over the bridge. I'm going to pick up the pink tail. So this one is going to look like that. And then last but not least, number four is going to be all pink. Now notice what I have is I have four haploid, genetically non-identical daughters. Didn't we say before at the beginning of chapter 10 that that was the outcome of meiosis? four genetically non-identical daughters. But take a look at them. Two of them look very similar, don't they? This one looks very much like dad one, doesn't it? This one looks very much like mom one, doesn't it? They look like the parents. So we call one and four parentals. Two and three, they look like a mixture of mom and dad. So two and three typically are referred to as recombinants. This is our first major genetic variation engine. Okay, think about this for a second. Let's take a look at genetic variation. Um, is it, do you think this is satisfactory to answer all of your questions about genetic variation? Think about what your question is. There will never be another you on this planet ever again. 
there never has been a you before, there will never be another you after. Genetically speaking, you are literally lightning in a bottle. You will never happen again. Do you believe that? Not for philosophical reasons, right? <laughs> but for genetic reasons. I mean, from variation wise, do you feel like that's, do you feel comfortable with the amount of variation that you get from this? No. To answer that. Well, think about it. A lot of times students will be like, well, wait a minute, really? I only see half of these actually being any kind of genetic variation at all. The others kind of look like they're just basically recapitulations of the previous generation. Do you think there's enough variation there to answer that question to say that of all 8 billion of us, there's never going to be another you? Do you feel like you need a little bit more variation to feel that that's true? Okay, let's think about this then for a second. Let's kind of flush this idea out. So to the novice, this looks like this, but it's actually not. One of the problems with genetics and especially inheritance that we do is we're nearsighted. We oftentimes tend to limit our inspection either just a generation or two before or a generation or two after us. And so what we see is we see our chromosome as being a direct descendant of our mom or dad's chromosome. But that's not the case. Why? Because your mom's chromosome actually isn't hers, or in this case, your dad's chromosome isn't his. Where did he get it from? He got it from his parents. And more than likely, he got a shuffled version. And where did they get their chromosome from? And their chromosome came from? Right, so really when you're taking a look at any chromosome here, you're talking about a shuffled, 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 shuffled chromosome. Whether it's been shuffled in the near generation or not, it's been shuffled in successive generations before you and likely will be shuffled by you after you. Think of it like this. It's like taking a puzzle. So really in, in our DNA, our chromosomes that we have aren't like, oh, I got my mom's chromosome. It's not that simple, right? Because we have, if you're into family history, we have nearly, as far as the eye can see, an infinite lineage of DNA that makes us up. And we probably only know it a very small slice of that. Right. This is the reason why 23 and me is so popular is because it basically reveals to people just how much of that is in there. A lot of people are surprised about some of the, the ancestry that they have. It's like, well, I had no idea that I had this in me. Yeah, but you do. You know, at this point, it's been shuffled up so much that you may have just a little slice of it left in there, but it's there. It's there. Right. And so we can see that that's kind of what 23 and me does. But basically, each one of these chromosomes is like a quilt of pieces that have been shuffled and passed on from one generation to the next. We can actually see this effect, by the way, in families that have a very dominant look. Like, uh, for instance, we see it in particularly in like um, fair uh, individuals, right? Like uh, a family that has like fair skin, fair eyes. And then let's say that there's a generation in there where uh, somebody marries into the family and they're very dark, right? Well, what you can see is as over the generations is you can see how the dark information, the genetic information for all the dark skin, hair, and things like that starts to get shuffled from one generation to the next. And you can kind of see how eventually it kind of starts to get randomized, right? So initially from a gener generation to the next, you can see that kind of pronounced darker look in the offspring of that individual, but over time, it kind of gets lost. And then it gets lost in these tiny little shuffled packets that are still sort of floating around in the family. And that's where 23andMe picks up, right? Cause like, oh, guess what? 
you've got some ancestry coming from Africa. Like, whoa, what? Yeah, because it, there was somebody in your family at one point that married in, and those that DNA is still there. It's still getting shuffled and swapped, but it's like small little pieces of it that are just kind of like being swapped back and forth. And every now and then, you may have a generation where a few of those things all come together, and then all of a sudden you have like, whoa, here's a dark one, right? So where did this come from? It seems like it came from nowhere. Well, no, it came from somewhere because you have that in your family. My family is a perfect example of that, right? I mean, a few generations ago, um, she wasn't black, but she was, what was she? Native American or something like that, but she was very dark. I mean, all her features, everybody else was a light haired, light eyed German look. Um, and she came in and she had all the dark hair. That's the reason why my, my dad has black hair and his dad has black hair and very dark features. And uh, so she came in and, and I mean, her genetics kind of dominated the family for a while. And I'm like, actually the first time where some of that has sort of been shuffled up so much that some of those more recessive things kind of came out. So I'm kind of getting uh, a little bit more of that lighter, that lighter look. But like my daughter, my middle daughter, it's kind of cute because she's got like really olivey skin. I mean, here I am. I mean, I'm not about as white as a snowbank, right? And uh, and it's like we look at her and we're like, where did you get your skin tone from? Because it's like that 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 really nice, pretty olive kind of color. And it's and it's like you look at me. I'm like, yeah, it's like okay. But that's kind of what came from a while ago. So that was like one of those little pieces of quilt that just happened to get shuffled through me. And she got it. So the other two are like me. They're just, yeah, they're just snowbanks. Right? That's, that's kind of what they are. They're cute, but they're snowbanks. Right? They're, they're cute snowbanks. They're snow bunnies. Um, but that's kind of like an interesting area, right? Because you kind of start to swap this back and forth. And that's what this guy looks like. So now all of a sudden, when you take a look at that, we basically have all these like little genetic packets all roaming through us that are all shuffling and then being moved on. But guess what? Only half of that's being moved on. So half of that's going to be moved on to one daughter. The other half is going to be moved on to another daughter or another son. And so you have this kind of randomization of everything. Think about it, though. It's not just in me. It's also in the mate as well. Right? So if you think about it, recombination is like a random number generator a genetic random number generator. So here's my question to you. The, the, most condom, condom, the most common random number generator that we um, run into is the lotto, right? The lottery, right? Has the same lottery number been pulled twice? No, right? because the probability of that happening is so remote, you would have to get so many different events that happen exactly the same way twice that it's nearly impossible to do that. Well, not only do we have a random number generator in one person, but in the mate is another separate random number generator. So in order to create somebody exactly like you, you would literally need to have both of your parents both random number generators hit on the exact same winning lottery number, not once, but twice in both parents, <laughs> right? In both parents. How likely do you think that's going to happen? Are you waiting around for that one? Are you spending money for that one? Let's go Vegas on this one. Are you picking up the odds on that one? You gonna pick up the over and the under on that? No, smart money says you walk away from that one and don't touch it, right? Why? Because it's not going to happen. It's impossible, a near mathematical impossibility for those two events to happen at the same time in two separate people. And that's before you get to the other random uh, variation engines. What about now? Are you feeling a little bit more confident about the fact that they're not going to find another you out there in the 8 billion people world? 
oh, but we're not done with you yet because there's more, there's more to be had. Genetics is a deep and fascinating reflection pool. Um, and that's why I love it because you can reflect on just about anything in life in a nice genetic pool, no pun intended. Um, but basically this is the comparison of meiosis one and mitosis. If you take a look at meiosis one, you can see that basically your job is to homologously pair these guys up, synapse them together, and then you got to cross them over. So here you can kind of see where they're crossed over. Now, the problem with this is you got these things glued together with the synaptic complex, which means that when you go through anaphase, you're going to have to untangle all that stuff, right? So there's a lot of resolution associated with this. And so when you go through anaphase one, you do untangle that. And then basically you move your homologs to either side. In mitosis, you have your sisters and they're only held together with cohesin. So as soon as that anaphase promoting complex eliminates that cohesin, then you get your sisters moving. So very simple system. Notice also that the key here is that in one, you are basically arranged in double file. In the other, you are in single file. That's key. We'll talk about that when we get to metaphase one in just a second. So crossing over, we already took a look at, right? So basically, essentially, a chiasmata is a physical representation, it's actual physical crossing over of the two uh, non-homologous <coughs> uh, sister chromatids. And they're basically exchanging information, right? So basically you can see how you're gonna be exchanging your information at the point of crossover. The more crossovers you have, the more exchange you have. By the way, you wanna add another little piece of random variation in there to screw up the variation engine for recombination. I didn't mention it to you guys, but I did mention it to the Monday, Wednesday um, morning uh, section, is that the actual crossover points are random. They're randomly placed. Not only that, but the number of crossovers is also random. You can have one crossover, two, or three crossovers. And you can have these things in varying positions. So in two different recombinational events, you can have two identical crossover events almost never. Because even if you did do this recapitulation, chances are this one's going to be slid either here in or out a little bit, creating a slightly extended version of overlap or a slightly minimized version of overlap. Remember, there's genes in that overlap. So that's a different mixture of genes that you're shuffling back and forth across the chromosome. So the fact that the actual placement, the location of these chiasma is random and the number is random pretty much means that to get the exact same recombinational pattern along with everything else is nearly impossible. So now you should be feeling good about yourself. You literally are lightning in a bottle, genetically speaking, right? And of course, personally speaking, I'll, I'll, I'll buy into that one, right? We're all like little lightning bugs in the bottle being tormented by fate. Right. I'm thinking of a Gary Larson cartoon, <laughs> shaking that bottle, banging us around. Some of us are a little bit more brow beaten because we've been smacking into the side of the bottle a lot. Don't do right there. Right. Got some bottle smacking headache going on there. So here's your prophase one. So here you can see, obviously, you got your spindle migration. You've got your chromosome decondensation, your uh, nuclear envelope hasn't. A broken down just yet, but you can see clearly you've got your homologous pairing and your synapses, and you can kind of see how you're starting to swap out genetic material between your two homologs, right? So this is basically your prophase one. Now, what about metaphase one? So in metaphase one, uh, basically what we have is the alignment of sisters side by side. So this is basically double filed. Right. And so when we take a look at metaphase one, we can see that basically you've got the same antipolar position. You're still going through the same process, by the way, of alignment. So you're still going through all that pro metaphase microtubule dynamic thing. You're still grabbing onto kinetic cores, or in this case, you're grabbing on to uh, homologs, and you're basically lining them up in double file. Remember, the double file is important because that basically means that you're going to have one homolog go to one side, the other homolog go to the other side. That's basically what that means. That's what that ensures when you're lined up in double file like that, okay? 
So the other thing that we're going to run into is random assortment. This one is the second major variation engine. And this is where I'm going to start on Monday. Okay. So I have two more to go. Uh, we should probably pretty comfortably be able to finish chapter 11 on Monday. So this is the next big one. So you're already feeling pretty good about recombinations, variation. So now we're just gonna to add to that variation story. 